Um, <coughs> hi, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Munro. I work for Enterprise DB, and I'm going to be talking about hash joins. Um, <coughs> just uh, very briefly uh, about me, I'm <coughs> the, the main um, thing I've been working on in the past few months is a proposal to make hash joins parallel aware. So um, this talk is going to have a, s a small component about my uh, proposal, but also just generally about uh, hash joins um, and, and their implementation in Postgres. Um, so I work on the um, uh, database server team at Enterprise DB, um, Robert Hauser's team. Cool. So this is the, the format of the talk. Um, just a bit of an introduction to um, joins, hash tables, and then simple hash joins. And then we'll get into the uh, hairy details of multi-batch hash joins and then talk about parallelism. So um, <coughs> basically, um, a bunch of uh, people at IBM in the 60s and 70s invented relational algebra and the um, implementation that uh, the, the, uh, System R sort of showed the world how to, how to do a SQL database. And um, <coughs> uh, in uh, in SQL, we have um, a whole bunch of um, ways of um, uh, writing join queries. And I'm going to go ahead and assume that you all know what these things all do. Um, so we've got, um, th these are all equi joins. They're all something equals something. Uh, so they're all taking two relations, joining them together, and spitting out a new relation. Um, and there's outer joins, inner, jo inner joins, semi joins here, here where you just test whether whether a, a matching row exists, uh, and so on. <coughs> so th there's, there's three basic strategies for executing joins in a relational database. Um, nested loops um, are almost from the definition of what, um, what a join is, sort of fall out of that. You just walk through one relation, and for each one, scan the other relation for a match. That could be via a sequential scan, or it could be via an index scan. Then there's merge joins, where both of the input relations are um, in the same order, or have been sorted, if necessary, to put them in the same order. And then you just walk them, walk through them um, sort of in sync, finding the matches. And then there's hash joins, which were um, the last to be discovered by people implementing databases. Um, and that, <coughs> that's you build a hash table from one of the relations, and then walk through the other relation probing the hash table to find matches. So if you step back a bit and squint, you can see that a hash join from my description is a little bit like having a nested loop with, a, with an in-memory index that you build on the fly for the inner relation. So um, <coughs> a couple of things we can say about hash joins. They need a lot of RAM. I mean, the basic idea, because you're building this temporary hash table um, in memory, you obviously need a bunch of memory, whereas those other um, uh, strategies don't necessarily need any RAM. Uh, you might need some RAM. Might be helpful if, you, if you're sorting for a merge join, but um, it's not necessary for um, index scans, for example. So um, <coughs> it was the invention of large RAM systems that came along um, a, a bit later in database history that led to hash joins being invented. But of course, when you have more RAM, that's also good for sorting. I think I've just lost a cable. No, I haven't. Um, so the choice of join algorithm um, can, in some cases, be limited by the join type and join conditions. Um, has anyone ever seen this error before? Um, actually, I believe somebody has something in the um, next commit fest to fix that particular problem, <coughs> which is very cool. Um, OK, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about hash tables um, as they exist in Postgres. Um, so. Um, there are at least three hash table implementations inside Postgres. Um, there's the DynaHash, which is sort of a, a general purpose hash table used in backend local memory in some cases and in shared memory in other cases. Um, that's a chaining um, hash table, meaning there's a linked list of pointers um, for the conflict resolution mechanism. Then there's simple hash, which Andres Freund added to um, the most recent release. Um, and that is an open addressing system with a different um, conflict resolution system. Um, and then the hash join operator has its own um, hash table implementation. Why, you might ask, when we have two perfectly good um, general purpose ones? Well, um, <coughs> the hash table that's used for hash joins is extremely simple. It's really nothing more than an array. Um, and one of the things about this particular hash table is that um, it has to deal with tuples that have the same key. 
um, not just because of an unintentional hash collision, but because the tuples actually had the same key. So this is a hash table, not like a Python dictionary or a C++ unordered map or whatever, um, because it, you know multiple um, copies of the key can finish up being being inserted, and you need them all there. So if you did use one of these other hash table implementations, you'd finish up having to do your own chain um, to deal with the multiple tuples at each at each value. And by the time you've done that, you've kind of you know, if you have to do that anyway, what are you really getting from using a general purpose hash table? Um, there's a couple of other things that, uh, properties of this hash table that make this very simple array approach um, appropriate. One is that the only thing we ever do with this hash table is insert everything in one phase and then probe it in another and then just throw the whole thing away. So it's sort of, I, sort of I, I started out thinking when I first started looking at this code, you know, why aren't we using the general purpose hash table? But, but then I came around to the view that this really is a case where just using an array does make a lot of sense. Um, okay. So in memory, it, it simply looks like an array um, where you hash your um, key somehow and produce a number and find the right slot. And there's a chain of tuples um, at each, uh, in each bucket. Um, another feature of this um, hash table, it's not really the hash table itself, but the way that the hash join operator deals with um, memory management is that it loads tuples into chunks of memory, and that reduces um, the overhead associated with individual allocations of tuples. Um, those chunks also provide a convenient way to iterate over all the tuples when we need to do a couple of different operations that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so... <coughs> um, Moving on to um, straightforward, simple hash joins. Um, when you use explain on a, uh, on a hash join, you see that there's the two different relations. Uh, what we call the outer plan and the inner plan are there. And the inner plan is the one that's hashed. Um, usually, that's the smaller of the two, uh, because we're looking for something that's going to fit in memory, hopefully. Um, so at a very high level, the algorithm has um, at least two phases. Um, for an inner join, you have the build phase where you load all the tuples from the inner relation into the hash table. And then the probe phase, where you scan the outer relation, trying to find matches in the hash table. If it's an outer join, you also need to find um, unmatched rows. So um, that third phase comes into play if it's a certain type of outer join, where we need to scan through all the tuples that are in the hash table in memory and look for unmatched rows. Um, there's a couple of optimizations. Um, we can uh, skip scanning either the outer or the inner um, relation um, in certain, in, in, un, under certain conditions. But um, obviously, outer joins prevent that. Um, <coughs> so the hash table consists of a certain number of buckets. It's just this array. Um, at plan time, we, uh, planning time, we figure out what size that should be. And we try to make sure that the load factor is one. In earlier versions of Postgres, we tried for a different number. Um, and I think that tension is because um, ideally we'd actually like to have one bucket per distinct value, uh, per distinct value, uh, key value, um, not per tuple. Um, but it's kind of hard to figure that out, I think. Um, so the planner estimates the number of rows in the inner relation. Hash table gets sized um, to the power of two greater than, or nearest power of two greater than um, the uh, number of rows that's ex expected. And um, after loading the hash table, if that turns out to be too high, then we, then we do a reasonably efficient thing where we find a, choose a new size if we need to, because we found out there were too many things in each bucket. Uh, and then we can just scan through all those chunks I talked about um, to um, reinsert all the tuples. So <coughs> here's an example where uh, originally the planner thought there were going to be 1,024 or fewer uh, keys in this hash table, but it turned out that in order to uh, meet its goal of a, of a load factor of one or below, it really needed 2048, and I did that by tricking it by writing an expression which is true for every row. I mod five is less than five, that's always true, um, but it looked at that and said, yeah, that's going to produce a smaller number of rows. So um, it, these um, cardinality estimations being wrong can lead to the um, uh, buckets having to be uh, tuples having to be reinserted into a reallocated um, hash table. So um, that's a very simple overview of, uh, of, of straightforward hash joins when no batching is involved. Um, but 
in order to deal with um, workmem and trying to make um, hash joins fit into a finite space that you set with the gook workmem, um, we need to use partitioning to um, reduce the amount of um, data that's loaded into memory at once. Um, the way we do that is by <coughs> the planner estimating, uh, um, finding how many batches it needs to chop the inner relation into so that each one will fit in work mem. Um, so there's a, this approach is known as the GRACE algorithm. Grace was, I think GRACE was actually a particular database machine um, developed in Japan, I think, that um, first tried this approach of having the planner estimate um, basically how many times to chop the input relation in half. Um, and there's a slight refinement to that idea, um, which is called hybrid, which is that um, the very first partition or batch is, um, is uh, loaded directly into the hash table. So we avoid writing one of the batches out to, um, uh, out to disk. Um, <laughs> now, it's possible that the planner could be wrong about um, how many batches it needs to chop the data into um, to stay under work mem. If, if that turns out to be the case, um, we have this adaptive approach, um, which will um, increase the number of batches. And I'm going to work through an example of that in a moment. There's an optimization um, whenever multi-batch hash joins are involved, um, which tries to move the most common values from the outer relation and make sure that they get processed at the same time as the first partition so that we can avoid having to write those out to disk. So this is an I.O. reduction technique. And I'm going to work through an example of that in just a moment. So um, when the hash join begins, and if the planner has determined that there's, it's going to need to chop the inner relation into batches in order to fit it into memory, the build phase sucks in all the tuples from the inner relation and then fires them to, several, to, to um, one of these, um, in this case, uh, five different places. Either it's decided in this case that it wants to have four partitions or batches. Um, so it loads all of those tuples that um, hash to partition zero into the hash table in memory. But if it sees any of the most common values from the, from the alpha relation, then it'll put them into this special side table, the skew hash table. Everything else goes into one of these batch files, and these are files on disk. After it's finished doing that, it then needs to probe, which means um, scanning the outer relation, pulling in every tuple, and first of all saying, well, wh which, which batch does this tuple uh, need to go in? And if it's batch zero, then it can immediately probe either the hash table or the skew hash table to see whether there's a, there's a matching tuple there. If it doesn't find a match, and, 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 and that may lead to um, emitting a tuple from, this, from the um, hash join operator. Tuples from the outer relation that, that um, need to go in any of the other batches get written out to a file on disk. So this operation is generating a ton of disk writes. So after it's finished processing batch 0, it now needs to process batch 1. So the, the first thing to do is to load all the tuples that we, written into, uh, that we wrote into, the, um, into batch 1 on the inner side into memory. And then we proceed, and we do that for each batch. That we, we then have a, another probe phase from the, uh, on the outer side. Now, here's where it gets interesting. When we come to process batch uh, two in this case, while loading tuples in from the uh, batch file on disk, we may actually discover that work mem is full. So what's happened here is that the planner decided we were going to have four batches, but the executor decided, uh, discovered that when it got to, in this case, partition two, it found that that, that was insufficient. It hasn't got enough memory, and it really wants to try and avoid using more than work mem. So in that case, um, our adaptive partitioning algorithm kicks in and decides to double the number of batches. So here you can see that on both sides, so conceptually, every single batch has been split in two. So, so when we have one of these, I call it a shrink operation, that word doesn't appear in the source code anywhere, but um, the, the contents of the hash table, which at this point, in time is, you know, it, it's um, crashed into work mem, so it's a, it's a large amount of data sitting in, in, in the hash table in memory, gets sp hopefully split in half. The goal is to split it in half, um, 
because when we double the number of partitions, hopefully half of the data that's in memory will finish up getting, um, will, will be able to stay there, but the other half of the data we can write out to, to um, disk to, to the new partition we created when we, spl when we split all the existing batches. Now it's possible that um, doubling the number of batches um, has no effect on how much memory we need because it's possible that all the tuples might um, hash to the same batch, in which case we have a problem on our hands, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so then when, after we've um, expanded the number of batches and we reach the probe phase again, um, and we start reading in tuples that we previously wrote out to outer file, the outer file for uh, batch two, we might encounter some tuples that we can immediately, that, that, that still belong in batch two, so we can use them to probe the hash table that's in memory. But we'll also encounter some that now need to be moved forward to a future batch that we've just created when we split all the batches. So yeah, it's, fairly, it's fairly complicated. Um, so um, stepping back from all that, that gives uh, I, terminology I made, up to uh, I made up to describe these sort of four different ways that, the, that a hash join can go. We have the optimal case which is where the planner thinks that the hash table is going to fit in memory. And when we come to execute the hash join, we find that that's true. Um, that's the optimal case when um, the hash join is doing a very good job. Then there's a good case, which is where the planner thinks that um, work mem is not enough to hold the whole in a relation memory. So it decides to use, say, four batches, like in that previous example. And then when we, when we come to execute the hash join, the executor finds that that's true. Um, it's still pretty good because if that data didn't fit um, in memory, um, some alternative plan like a merge join, uh, it would probably have a similar problem if the data doesn't fit in memory and it needed to sort it, it would need to um, start doing some disk IO too. So, you know, it's still a good plan. Um, when things start getting bad is when uh, <coughs> The planner set out, it thought it had an optimal or a good case on its hands, but when we came to execute the hash join, um, the executor discovers that, that, like in the case we worked through with pictures, um, work mem is not enough. So now we need to start um, dumping tuples out to disk, and uh, that it starts increasing the, the, the amount of disk I.O. considerably, potentially. Um, and then there's a special case of bad, which I call ugly, uh, where <coughs> it's reasonably unlikely, but it's possible, and, and it's certainly easy to contrive, a case where um, n no amount of repartitioning is going to help and the data is never going to fit in memory. And that, in that case, we have no choice currently but to stop respecting work mem. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen that before. <laughs> um, that might happen if you're unlucky. Um, of course, in many uh, common cases, it's still just going to work in, 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 in normal level notice. But from time to time on the mailing list, you'll see someone complaining about this, and it's because of this kind of problem. But that, that ugly case happens when you have too many duplicate values. Yeah. Yes. OK. So um, just really quickly, um, here are some examples of the optimal good, bad, and ugly cases. Um, optimal here, we see that the. Um, I don't know if you can see that's in bold there. I, uh, I sh the planner said that there would, be, that there would be one batch, and at execution time, that was true. We set work mem to 64 megabytes, and the memory usage turned out to be 43 megabytes. That was a perfectly good hash join. Everything went fine. And here we have the good case. In this case, um, the planner determined that 64 batches would be enough to stand underneath work mem. I set work mem to one megabyte here, and the hash join ran. Uh, perfectly fine. It used 64 batches, and it never used more than a megabyte of memory, so all good. Um, here's the bad case. Uh, the, planner, the planner determined that one batch would be sufficient, um, but it turned out at runtime that the executor needed to split many times uh, to, to reach 64 batches. But it still managed to stay under the goal, uh, work, target work mem of one megabyte. Memory usage was 808. That's the peak memory usage. Um, and then in the ugly case, <coughs> I actually made a, a really badly skewed table uh, here, which is called awkwardly skewed. And um, I made sure that the stats would be wrong. There's various ways that the stats can be wrong. Um, in this case, I just like 
alt at table, um, don't vacuum this thing, please, ever. And then you know, I did some tricks to make sure that the stats would be wrong. But, but the stats could be wrong easily for many reasons that are not contrived. Uh, and in this case, it determined, the planner determined that one batch would be sufficient. Um, at execution time, it split the, um, it, you know, repartitioned. Um, and it observed that further repartitioning would not help. So it gave up, threw its hands in the air, and then continued the hash join. And even though I said we had one megabyte of work mem, it managed to use 35 megabytes at peak. So obviously, in some case, it could decide to use 48 gigabytes, and we only have one, and kaboom. Um, so we'll talk about, um, I, I've got an open problem section at the end where I'll talk about um, some potential solutions to that problem. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about parallel hash join. Um, but first, let's do a quick recap of the situation, what parallel query, the relevant bits of parallel query for this problem space. So parallel query is based on the idea of partial plans. Partial plans are um, query plans that can be run by many workers in parallel, but each worker, and each worker will see a, a, a fraction of the total results. But together, they'll all see all of the results, or generate all of the results. So um, <coughs> usually at the bottom uh, sort of leaf uh, nodes in a, in a parallel query plan, you've, uh, got a, you've got some source of parallelism, which is usually a, a, a parallel sequential scan or a parallel index scan. In future, there could be more ways of producing uh, parallelism, but that's kind of the source of parallelism. Um, and at the moment, the granularity um, is always pages. And somewhere above that, there's going to be a gather or gather merge node. And everything in between the gather merge node and the um, uh, parallel scan nodes is a partial plan. So we have um, hash joins can, can be involved in, in parallel queries at the moment in 9.6 and 10. Um, but those hash joins are parallel obliv oblivious, meaning that they're not doing anything special. They don't know about parallelism as far as they can. I mean, the only reason that, I mean, the only reason it works is because the outer relation they're seeing is partial, as in it's receiving a fraction of the, of the total set of tuples. The hash join node is completely unaware of that and it's simply built a copy of the hash table from the inner side in each worker. And um, the planner has proven that that's safe. And there's various cases where it wouldn't be safe. Uh, for example, I said here, problem two, since there are multiple hash tables, which are all kind of copies of the same hash table, um, certain kinds of outer joins can't, can't be run this way because the, there's many different sets of the match flags, for example. Um, but the main problem with this is that um, each worker is going to produce a copy of the hash table. So it's run a plan that um, does a whole bunch of work, and then it's used up a whole lot of memory holding the results in a hash table. So um, I've seen quite a few slides today that have a Amdahl's law slide. Um, I decided to make an Amdahl's outlaw slide because um, at first this seems, you know, running the probe phase in parallel, but not running the build phase in parallel, seems like a straightforward case of Amdahl's law. Like you've got the, the bit that you made faster by adding more uh, concurrency, you know, parallelism, and the bit that you can't make faster. But actually, it's worse than that. Because um, running n copies of the same plan um, actually creates damage. You know, it, actually, it actually generates a ton of contention on all kinds of resources, buffer locks, and so on. And also uses up a ton of memory for nothing, you know, all these copies, all these copied hash tables. And it's actually okay if the inner plan is, is very small and the resulting hash table is very small, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't, it doesn't use many resources. But the interesting cases here are ones where, where the hash table would be large. And none of these externalities are included in our costing models. So that's why I have a picture of this polar bear on a, you know, the melting Arctic uh, circle situation because it's, you know, like economists talk about externalities, you know, um, your, fa your factory doesn't, uh, <laughs> you're actually damaging your environment by doing this, right? So, um, so the basic approaches to, um, uh, to solving this problem, making the hash join completely parallel and not just parallel in the build phase, are partition-wise joins, and we have um, a project in development for that. Um, my colleague Ashutosh Bapad is working on that uh, with others. Um, so that, uh, that idea is basically just saying, well, you've got a whole bunch, you've, if you've got a partitioning scheme 
on um, both on, 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 on the tables involved and the partitioning schemes match, then you can simply you know, plan a, hash, a, a parallel oblivious hash join on each partition and everything will be just fine with no communication and that's great. And we will have that, but it will only help you if your, if your, partition, if your partitioning scheme is uh, set up just right. Um, another approach is dynamic repartitioning. And there are a whole bunch of different strategies for that. One strategy is that it might be that one, uh, one side of your um, uh, hash join is suitably partitioned, and the other side can be repartitioned on the fly to match. Um, there's also, there's the possibility that, that, that no partitioning is involved at all, so you need to repartition both sides to match. Um, and then the third approach is using a shared hash table. In the literature, they refer to this as no partition um, hash tables. And I have a proposal to do that. So how do we choose between all these different um, approaches? Well, we don't actually have to choose because um, certainly the first one, partition-wise joins, we should definitely have and we will have. It's just that that can't, that can't deal with all of your join requirements. It's, it's not a completely general solution. Um, the, the repartitioning schemes are really interesting. So the state-of-the-art cache-aware repartitioning algorithm called Radix join um, is, um, there's a lot of stuff written about this and there are, and there are systems out there doing this. It does a really expensive uh, multi-pass um, partitioning phase before it even begins the build phase of the hash join. And the goal of that is to minimize cache misses during probing. So it actually knows about the size of your L1 cache and your L2 cache and knows things about NUMA nodes and all that kind of stuff. And it does like a ton of work up front. And it makes the probe phase so cheap that it manages to win back that time, um, which is really interesting. It's, that, that, that really says something about how expensive cache misses are. And hash tables, of course, are prone to um, cache misses because you're randomly accessing a memory all over the place. And like, there could be gigabytes of hash table in memory and you're, you know. Ooh. Can you hear me now? I think the battery might have died. Would it be fair to say that uh, what you're describing expressly sacrifices compute bandwidth in order to make it up in bandwidth? Yes. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. You can? OK. <laughs> Repeat the question. OK. So uh, <laughs> Peter asked if um, it would be fair to say that this is a trade off between memory bandwidth and compute bandwidth. Absolutely, it is. Yes. OK. Um, are both microphones working now? Can you guys hear me? No. OK, I'll speak loud. OK, so um, dynamic repartitioning uh, hash joins are really interesting. They're also extremely complicated. Um, and <laughs> several researchers, I've got some references for this, uh, if you want to look this up later, which will be at the end. Several researchers have claimed and shown that uh, just a really simple shared hash table based system is usually about as good um, in many interesting cases and it can be better in skewed cases. And the funny thing about data is that your data is skewed. So researchers who are working with non-skewed data are not necessarily, I mean, it's very interesting, but it, you, know, you, you have to consider skewed data as a, as a very common case. Um, so, and <coughs> there, there are people arguing with each other and trading papers that say each other saying the other guy is wrong in, right now. This is like a, quite a hot topic. Um, but one thing that I figured out from reading about this is that um, the bar for beating a plain old big shared hash table is really high. Like in terms of engineering challenges, um, I don't think we can build a dynamic state-of-the-art cache-aware, like hardware-aware repartitioning algorithm thing that would work in any time soon. So um, in terms of communication between backends, in terms of all kinds of things that are non-portable, well, you know, that's, portability is an issue. Have a one cache size. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So th that is an interesting topic. Um, I, I don't think I can do that. And I don't think it'll, I think it would take us, and I think in, in years to come, you know, uh, it could be interesting to look into that. Um, I uh, decided to take the advice of a number of researchers who say, um, if you don't have a partitioning phase, you don't have to do that. Um, you, in many common and interesting cases, it works out better anyway. Um, so my 
So, yeah, simple repartitioning algorithms always lose. So we, we already have a simple repartitioning algorithm, which is, the, um, which is the one we do for batching, right? So if you don't have enough workmen, we already do this repartitioning. People who have built systems like that, uh, well, the research papers that I've got links to at the end, um, uh, you know, those types of systems um, that don't try, see, those types of systems aren't actually trying to reduce cache misses. They're actually just trying to chop the data up arbitrarily so that it fits, right? Um, while maintaining the property that the partitions are disjoint, disjoint on both sides so that the, so the logic still works and you get the right answer. But they're not trying to reduce the cache misses. If you have a, if you have a partitioning phase, but you don't get anything back in terms of cache hits, then you'll lose. That, that seems to be the, uh, you know, the, the economic trade-off, the way it works. Um, Right, so, yeah, so Peter's question was, could we imagine a future where we would want to do the radix? Um, eventually, if, eventually, we'll have to as, as hardware advances. Okay, so um, it's certainly possible, yeah. I mean, one of the, I, I, um, I don't think I've read anywhere near as much uh, of the database literature as you have, Peter, but, but I think that um, from what I have read, um, one of the factors in, in this whole thing is the constantly changing economics. Like, for example, the, the sort versus hash debate, which has been raging since about 1980 or something, whether it's better to sort stuff and do a merge join or do a, a hash join. As far as I know, hash joins are basically in the lead, but there's always a lot of papers saying that, um, do you know, in about two years' time, they'll have SIMD vectorization that's this wide, and then we'll win. And, but, you know, I mean, we just have to wait and see how that, how that pans out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, my proposal uh, is the relatively simple approach of just sharing the hash table. Um, Emphasis on relative. Relatively simple, yeah. Um, but there, there have been a lot of complications, and the actual shared hash table hash join I got working really quickly, um, but then like there were so many sub problems and special cases and, and things that I spent a lot of time on. Um, so the basic idea is to load the hash table into um, uh, shared memory, into DSM segments. DSM segments being Postgres's abstraction of basically mapped files or something like that, uh, something equivalent on each platform <laughs> that um, has the properties that you can always make more uh, or ask the operating system for more, unlike the traditional Postgres shared memory, which is fixed at startup. And also that pointers are not... Um, uh, you can't naively exchange pointers because the memory might be mapped at a different address in each backend, backend process. Ancient decisions in Postgres's design history that we uh, code around. Okay, so the basic idea is that we um, is that during the build phase we insert stuff into buckets using compare and swap. So there's no um, you know lock partitioning or anything like that. It's just compare and swap to insert stuff. So hopefully you're inserting different keys and that's going to work nicely because you'll be just compare and swap doing compare and swap operations on different buckets. Um, however, between the build and the probe phase, you, you have to wait for all workers to finish building the hash table. Nobody can begin probing until every tuple's been loaded, right? Um, otherwise, the answer will be wrong. Um, unlike those, all those, so, so we have to introduce this, this wait point, synchronization point at the end of build. And that's done using a barrier um, an IPC mechanism that was one of the things I had to write to get this thing going. Now, <coughs> the competing repartitioning uh, systems, they also do a ton of communication and waiting for each other and stuff as well. So it's not as though, even though once they finally get to the build phase, they can, uh, they can run the build and then the probe without any communication. Hooray, that's great. But they had to do a lot of communication to get to that point. So um, adding one synchronization point between build and uh, probe, uh, it seems to be not as... It doesn't seem to be that bad, um, and certainly in practice, I, can, I can't really measure any effect from that. So some of the things I had to build to get this thing going uh, were the shared memory allocator. So that's the thing that can create all these DSM segments, the, these mmap files, essentially, and, and um, uh, 
allocate space and manage the space within them. Uh, that's been committed into Postgres 10 and is also used by the um, sh uh, parallel bitmap um, heap scan. Uh, then I had to deal with um, shared temporary files, and I haven't, still haven't quite finished arguing with those. Um, and that um, involved uh, quite a bit of discussion with uh, Peter, who, Peter Gagan, whose um, uh, parallel create index can also benefit from shared temporary files. Shared tuple stores, shared record type mod registry, and a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, right. So um, here's, a, here's like a really simple example that just tries to show the, the hash join operator. I'm not showing TPCH results or anything like that. This is just like a very simple uh, three join example. And it's, it's doing an aggregate so that there isn't really any processing above the gather node that you have to worry about. So I'm just trying to capture the raw hash join speed um, of a very simple table that has like 10 million rows or something. I think they're integers. Um, so on the um, x-axis, you can see the number, of, um, the number of workers, that is, number of processes in addition to the back end that you're logged into and running queries on. So where it says 0, that means there's one process. And where it says 1, there's two processes and so on. And um, speed up is shown on the side there. Now, in the unpatched code, so this is basically Postgres 10, um, it, it's green there, you can see that it's not actually getting much speed up as we add more workers. Now, Thinking back to the Armdahl, uh, Armdahl thing, you've got like the, the build phase, which we know um, is being run a complete copy in each back end in, in, in master. But the probe phase should be run in, in parallel. So you'd expect this line to be going up. And it isn't really going up, is it? I mean, it's going up a little bit at 1 and 2, but then it sort of flat, flattens out. So on my um, you know, external, external costs um, slide from a few slides back, uh, I think what we're seeing here is that the, even though the um, increased parallelism is causing it to um, run the probe phase um, faster, um, it still sucks overall because the, you know, as you add more workers, each worker is now building another one of these gigantic hash tables and like thrashing the, the page cache system and, the, and, and um, uh, using RAM and uh, all these things. Um, <coughs> On the other hand, if you look at the patched uh, line, you can see the speed up is it's kind of a line. It's basically a line. But it, but it isn't. Um, when, we add, when we add each worker, we don't get another 100% speed up, uh, as you would hope. Um, and I, I haven't researched this fully yet. I think what we're seeing there, what we're seeing there is, the, um, uh, is just the underlying sequ sequential scan not being as good as it could. And um, there is a patch out there that would fix that um, from David Rowley, which I'm planning to test with some simple examples like that and see if I can get that line to go to become pure linear speed up. Um, so here are the query plans there. Um, the unpatched version, you can see, sorry, it cuts off at the end, but nothing interesting is on that side. So um, you can see that there's um, the three joins here. Um, each one uses, let's call that 500 megabytes of, 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 of memory. But because there are four workers, five, five processes in total, and three of those hash join nodes, or hash nodes, that actually leads to a total of 7.5 uh, 7 gigabytes. Did I add that up right? That's a lot of memory. Um, so yeah, we've actually, uh, that we've actually asked this computer to, to, to generate and then insert 7.5 gigabytes of duplicate junk into memory, right? Uh, whereas with the... Um, the patched version, we see that all of the hash nodes changed into parallel shared hash no, uh, nodes in the query plan. Um, the amount of memory usage for each of these hash nodes is still about 500 megabytes. <clears throat> it should actually be exactly the same number, but it's not because I, in this patch, I uh, changed the recipe for how that memory is accounted for. So it's, ch it's changed what explain shows. It hasn't changed the truth. It's just made the answers more truthful. Um, but it's basically about 500 megabytes. Um, and so the total, it comes out to um, 1.5 gigabytes instead of 7.5 gigabytes. And I think that, you know, you can sort of see that the computer has had to do an awful lot more work to deal with the 7.5 gigabytes of data. Um, and you get the answer sooner. OK, so um, uh, how are we doing for time here? Got five more minutes. Ashutosh.
So Ashutosh asks. So Ashutosh asks. Um, Ashutosh asks how it would affect it if we didn't have the aggregate there. The, the reason I put the aggregate there is because I wanted to measure just the hash joins um, speed. I didn't want to deal with the fact that the there'd be a gather node that has to spit out millions and millions of rows. Um, I think that would just kind of pollute the make the measurements harder to understand. Um, that's the reason I put the the um, count there. Okay, <coughs> so. Um, there's just a few minutes left. I'm just going to talk very quickly about some open problems. This is not to, to do with parallelism, just to do with hash joins in, in, in general. These are just some things that are on my list, things that I think are interesting that we should fix or improve or contemplate for hash joins in general. So the first one, I talked before about good, bad, and ugly cases. In the ugly case, Postgres will hopefully produce your, your, um, your answer, but it might not if you haven't got enough RAM, right? So there's, I've thought of a couple of different ways of attacking the problem. I mentioned this on the list, exchanged a, uh, an email with uh, Tom Lane about, uh, about this. Uh, so no, the first thing is you could switch to a, a sort merge for the problematic partition when you realize that it's never going to fit in work mem. It seems like a solution, but the problem is, well, firstly, dynamically changing to a different query plan for one partition is kind of weird. We don't have any other examples of that. And it, I don't know how you'd set that up. It would be a bit complicated. But somehow that's just programming, right? It seems like it should work. Unfortunately, there are some cases where, um, uh, because of available operators and details, not every query that Postgres is happy to run as a hash join can be run as a merge join because of missing operators, incompatible operators, which is a, a bit of a pain. So we could just say, well, we don't care about that, or from now on we require all data types to have the, the right set of operators, but that's kind of hard to do. <coughs> but you could just say, well, okay, your computer could still run out of memory if you don't have the right operators, but otherwise we'll switch to a sort merge. I don't know, maybe that's a, that's a solution. Uh, another approach would be to invent a new algorithm for processing the batch in multiple passes. Um, that has some complications for dealing with those matched bits, which you have to keep track of, and I haven't really figured out the answer to that yet. Um, so yeah, a couple of different, ide uh, different, different ideas there. Uh, also, there's a closely related problem with um, hash aggregates. Um, you can quite easily write a query that will make your computer melt using hash ag aggregates. Um, okay, another thing which comes up uh, from every couple of years on the mailing list is why can't we use Bloom filters to make things faster? Um, so there's a couple of different uh, places where you could use this. We know that other databases do this. They take, they, they plan a hash join, they've built a hash table, they've done all this work to figure out, and, and uh, they've done all the computations required to make a s relatively small Bloom filter to say, for um, filtering out. Um, rows from the outer side, and then they can push that all the way down to a, to, to a scan so that they can basically filter out some tuples closer to the data, closer to the disk, whatever, right? But no one's ever figured out how to do that and make it win in Postgres. Um, Peter Gagan here pointed me out a paper from a student, uh, I think it was an undergrad project, uh, from a student in Singapore who um, wrote this, got it completely working, and then showed some nice graphs that appear to, appear to win in some cases, and then didn't send us the patch, and no one's ever heard of it. So uh, um, uh, maybe I should email him <laughs> and say, can you send us the patch? But um, anyway, um, so that's, that's an interesting th uh, case. Um, and there's a another idea here, which um, again is from Peter Gagan. Um, he and I spent a bit of time talking about all this stuff because um, there is some code we can share between this and his project for um, parallel create index. Uh, that got us talking about various topics. And he had the idea that you could use Bloom filters to filter the data that you write out to those relation uh, so out of relation batch files, preventing a bunch of disk I/O. Now it might be that Bloom filters in general can't speed things up enough for optimal, happy, small hash, smaller hash joins, but that they might still be able to prevent you from doing a whole bunch of really expensive disk I/O. So that's a, um, a an interesting case to look into. Right, yes. Uh, P Peter says uh, quite rightly that, that Bloom filters only save you um, cycles if they actually filter stuff out, right? Otherwise, they just cost you cycles for nothing. Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> while looking, looking into all this stuff, I figured out that <coughs> in Postgres, what we call, well, in Postgres, we usually produce left deep um, 
join stacks, but we can produce bushy uh, plans and write deep plans for um, uh, for nested joins, you know, stacks of joins. Typically, you'll see left deep, uh, left deep uh, plans. And one interesting thing that I figured out is that um, most databases produce left deep plans. Um, the original system R implementation only did left deep plans, um, but you'll find Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, you quite often see left deep uh, plans. But strangely, um, we seem to be the only ones who call the side that we hash the, the um, right hand side for a hash join. Everyone else, as far as I can tell, everything, every database I've found information on, Hash is the left relation, and they also call it the driving relation, even though it's the hash table. It's the other way around, because we're sort of thinking of it as the hash table being like the inner side of a nested loop. It's the thing you're probing, so we call that the right-hand side uh, and the inner side. This is all very confusing, but everyone else is doing it the other way around, which means that their left deep plans have the property that uh, each... When R and, R and S are joined together in, say, Oracle or SQL Server, um, producing a hash table full of, uh, uh, feeding the hash table above, above that join, and then that feeds the hash table above that join. So you only ever need two hash tables in memory at once. Maybe, maybe, maybe most of the time you don't care about that, but if they're gigantic hash tables, like gigabytes, and there is a whole stack of them, you really don't want to have those all in memory at the same time. Those guys only have two of them in memory at the same time. We have all of them in memory at the same time. I think that's kind of interesting. I don't have any, I mean, I know that me, whole query plan memory usage is a gigantic can of worms, and I know, um, I've never discussed it uh, publicly, but I've read the archives on this, and there's just great big long conversations that never go anywhere because it's really hard to um, constrain memory globally in, in a useful way. It's kind of got all kinds of circular problems in it. Um, but this, isn't, this is kind of thinking about total memory usage, but not, not in that way where you have to actually model it. It's just saying, hey, we only need two hash, uh, two hash tables at once. Let's do it that way. Uh, that's something we could perhaps consider. Um, what is the slide supposed to say that it says they minimize the, oh, we maximize the memory? Yeah, so, so by, we don't even try to minimize, we don't, by, doing, by, by typically doing a left deep um, plan, We'll finish up with all hash tables in memory. We'll maximize memory, peak memory usage. Um, they, in this case, I'm talking about SQL Server and Oracle. I think DB2 is probably the same, but I haven't looked into it. Um, they would only have two at a time. Now, even if we did a right deep join, which I believe we're capable of, of generating, although I haven't seen one recently, um, we still don't actually free the hash table as soon as we could, so you still wouldn't get anything out of it. But if you did both of those things, then you could have only two hash tables in memory at once. Um, that might actually be, an, that might enable things that would otherwise um, not be possible. Um, so I, I think the, <coughs> the uh, reason, one of the reasons why uh, uh, joining them all together, putting everything in memory, is uh, something that's in the other systems, and in this one I suppose it is, is that it enables you to do uh, bit map sending joining, to, to push down a balloon filter. So okay. It, That is very interesting and ties back to the pre these two slides together, which I didn't know were related. Thank you. So um, Jim says that uh, the, the choice between left and, uh, and right deep uh, joins um, has an impact on whether or not you can push bloom filters down to scans. That is, that is a very interesting thing, which I now plan to look into. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, much more uh, low-level thing. We have these chunks of 32 kilobytes. Um, one thing that's wrong with that is that some operating systems, when you ask for 32 kilobytes plus a tiny header, it actually eats 36 kilobytes, and that's like 12.5% extra or something like that, is it? Whatever it is, it's just a waste of memory. Um, another, uh, yeah, there may be other reasons to, inc to, to increase the chunk size. I don't know. That's something to, uh, to, to, to look into. Um, actually, that's all I have, and the time is, I've actually run over. But uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please, please do. I've answered all of your questions. Good.